So today we are in the book of 1 John chapter 3. We're going to study verses 16 through 24. And let's pray. Our Father, we, we thank you that um, our family, we're, we're able to gather together and the rest of our family, they're able to watch the service online. And, and so, Lord, I, I thank you that your word is alive, it's active, sharper than any double-edged sword. And, and Lord, it's being opened, Lord. As it's being opened, Lord, may your word um, pierce our hearts, Lord. And Lord, if there's any ways that's not pleasing to you, Lord, I pray that the gentleness of your Holy Spirit will bring it to our attention, that we would, we would honor you, Lord, and that we would live for you, Lord Jesus. And for those that are going through a different difficult time, Father. And I just pray that you, Lord Jesus, as you were the good shepherd, that you would minister to the people, Lord. And Lord, I pray by the time we all leave um, our sanctuary here, that we would leave more in love with Jesus than, than we did before when we sat down in our chairs. So Lord, would you move? Our hearts are open. Our, our ears are open, Lord. So Holy Spirit, do what you want to do in our lives. We belong to you. We pray this in the name of Jesus. And we all said, Amen. Amen. Reading verses 16 through 24 out of the book of 1 John chapter 3. By this, we know love because he laid down his life for us. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. But whoever has this world's goods and sees his brother in need and shuts up his heart from him, how does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. By this, we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our hearts before him. If, for if our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. And this is his commandment, that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now, as he, he who keeps his commandments abides in him and he abides in him, and by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. Today, we are going to learn five marks of a believer, five marks of a believer. And the first mark of a believer that we are going to learn is that Jesus is our example. Jesus is our example. And we're going to see that in verse 16. Let's look at verse 16 um, once again. By this, we know love because he laid down his life for us, and we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. So in verse 16, John gives us three aspects of Christ's death, three aspects of the death of Jesus Christ. The first aspect of the death of Jesus Christ that John points out is that Christ's death was done in love for us. Christ's death was done in love for us. We know as believers, the ultimate demonstration of love was given by Jesus upon the cross. In the book of Romans chapter 5 verse 8, the Bible declares God demonstrated his love towards us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. If you ever, if you ever wonder what real love looks like, or if you ever wonder what real love should look like, look no further than to the person of Jesus Christ. The fact is that every single human being desires and craves to be loved. And oftentimes we look in the wrong places and in the wrong ways to receive love. But John says in verse 16, he says, we know. He says, we know. Certainly, You may want to circle that. We know. It speaks about having a confidence a confidence, and, and we know those words are in the perfect tense, meaning something happened in the past, and the result should continue each and every single day in the present. We know that the Lord loves us, and every single time that you look at the cross, may it just shout to you how much Jesus loves you. I've shared this story with you before, and it bears repetition at this point. It's a story about um, a back-to-school night that uh, a sixth grade class had. 
And this student, being a sixth grader, a boy, he was kind of, unfortunately, a little embarrassed of his mommy. Because you see, his mom, she had a gnarly scar across her face. And he didn't want his mom to go in the classroom and his fellow students to see his mom because you know how kids could be, students could be the next day, they could start teasing you about all little, little things. And he just didn't want to go through that because he knew that his mom's scar was very, very unique. And so it was the day of, of the back to school um, night. Mom was so excited to meet um, her son's teacher. She was excited to find out where he sits in the class. And so she was real, real excited. So they both got in the car and they rode up to the school. Um, she got out and he kind of stayed in the car and he, and he said, son, you need to come on. It's time to go into your class. I want to meet your teacher. I want to see where you sit. And she was just so happy. So they both walked in, in the classroom and, and then the mom uh, stood in the line to talk to the teacher. And then um, it was her turn to talk to, talk to the teacher teacher and and then the, the teacher the teacher looked at at the scar across her face and the teacher asked and and she said man I, ma'am I, I don't want to be disrespectful but I've never really seen a scar like that across anyone's face would you mind to tell me the story and the mom said sure I, I, I will and and the boy never knew the complete story so he he snuck up behind his mom and the mom started sh- sharing the story she said um I'm a single mom, and and um, what happened one night is that the fire alarm went off, and we live in an apartment, and um, and as the fire um, alarm went off, there was fire in our apartment, and so I just ran into my son's room, and as I ran into my my son's room, immediately I saw there was a big piece of wood that was coming down on my son's crib. And, and she said, as a mama, my instinct just jumped in. And all I did is I ran and I jumped in front of the crib and the wood hit my face and burned me for life. The boy started to cry, didn't even care what his friends would say. and said, mama, I never knew you got that scar because of me. Mama, every single time that I look at your face and I see that scar, it's going to shout to me how much you love me. In a very real way, every single time that you look at the cross, may it shout to you how much Jesus loves you. And he loves us. And so we know that Christ died upon the cross for us. And he loves us so much. Uh, may we be daily remindful of that fact. Pastor Chuck um, once said at, at a pastor conference, and, and actually yesterday was his homecoming, seven years ago, he, Jesus said, all right, Chuck, it's time to come up. Um, you lay the foundation, you, you, you taught about teaching through the word of God, and, and you lived a, a grace-filled life, and now, you know, it's the other guy's turn. Come home, I miss you. Spend, spend time with me. He once said that, this at a pastor's conference. He, he said, always remind the people that they are loved and they are forgiven. Because those are two areas that the enemy lies to the believer, that they're not loved and that they're not forgiven. And so, no, we are loved unconditionally and we are forgiven. And and may we rest in that fact and rest in that truth. Now, the second aspect of Christ's death that, that John writes about in verse 16 is that Christ laid down his life for us. And you will see that in verse 16 where it says he laid down his life for us. And know this. Know that Jesus, he freely laid down his life and he did so with joy because he knew the outcome. He knew the outcome of it. And there's times where things are hard. And I know for for many of us, but always look to the outcome. Always look to the outcome. In the book of Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, the writer writes, For it was the joy that was set before him. That caused him to endure the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. And so we know that Jesus simply did not talk about loved. He proved it by his action. So who did he love? He loved all people, including his enemies. When did he love? When people were at their worst. And how did he love? He loved with his whole life. The third aspect of Christ's death that John writes about in verse 16, and, it, and it's that Christ desires that we now lay down our life for the brethren. 
we now lay down our life for the brother. And we, see, we, we read about that in verse 16. And all, uh, also ought to lay down our lives for, for the brethren. And we also ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. And know that Jesus is our example. Jesus will never ask you to do something that he first didn't do himself. And so we as believers, we need to follow our, 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 our master. We need to follow King Jesus. The scriptures speak about that. Would you turn to 1 John chapter 2, verse 6? You're in chapter 3. Turn to 1 John chapter 2, verse 6. There's a scripture I want to point out to you that it's worthy to, to underscore. Chapter 2, verse 6 says, He who says he abides in him, underscore this, ought himself also to walk just as he walked powerful scripture it's saying if someone says hey i'm a christian i'm a christian and, and if we claim to be a christian we ought to walk as he walked and so the lord is saying now i lay down my life for the brethren it's your turn it's your turn you go ahead and do that now and know to lay down our, our lives for others it does involve sacrifice and 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 know when we lay down our, our life for for others there is a sense of dying there's a sense of dying that, that comes with it. And by the way, it's so healthy to, to crucify what is referred to the trinity of me, myself, and I. It's so healthy to crucify ourselves. And when we demonstrate this true biblical love, it, it, it means that, is that someone else's life is more important than, than our life. That we want to make their life better. We want to make someone else's life fuller. And, and in fact, the Bible calls us in the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 24, we are called to be helpers of people's joy. So when, when we wake up in the morning, it's all about others. It's all about others. And it's the best way to live life. Because if you try to live life to fulfill your needs, you can never do it. Our needs will continue to, to be great. Our, our want will continue to grow. You can never satisfy self. But when you serve other people and, and you give your life for others, oh, what joy that is. Joy, J-O-Y, Jesus, others, than yourself. And, and when we live that way, have that philosophy way of thinking, honestly, it's really the best way to live life. It, it's called looking out the window versus looking at the mirror. Looking at the mirror, you're, you will you will see flaws in, in ourselves. But when you're looking out the, the 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 window, serving other people, you don't have time necessary to look at yourself because you're looking at others. I know I, I spoke to a few brothers um, last week uh, when they were um, putting things together and getting all things um, set. Um, like Victor and Enrique and, and others, and 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 um, during the, every step of the way, I just thank them abundantly. Like, thank you for all the the work that you're doing to to get this ready for God's people. And you know what they said? It's a joy to serve others. There's just something about serving other people's, and and one one of the healthiest um, um, components that we can do when we are going through a difficult time is to think about other people and serve other people, pray for other people. It's one of the best things that we can really, really, really do. And so we are called, we are called to, to take up our cross just like Jesus did. And we're called to crucify our flesh. And, and for most of us, we are ready. And I know, especially the men, you, you're ready to lay your, life, lay your life down in great one great dramatic historical gesture. And I know all people w would do that. If you had to do it, you, you will do that. And, and that is so honorable. But And though as we as Christians... We are called to lay our lives down piece by piece, little by little, in small, tangible ways each and every single day. So when John writes in verse 16 that we are to lay down um, our, our lives, that speaks about a way of life. It's a way of life. It's to be um, a continual habit. It's not, it's not to be seasonal, but it's to have a determination of the will, and it should be a lifestyle. The Christian life is an other-centered life, and frankly, like I mentioned, it is the best way to live life. The book of Philippians chapter 2, verse 3, the Bible says, Let nothing be done through selfish ambition or conceit, but in low of mind, let each esteem others better than himself. Let each of you look not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And the truth is that we should be the, the most other-centered, loving, forgiving people upon the face of the earth. Why? Because the Lord has forgiven us. 
And he has given himself for us. And we're just following what, what Jesus says. And you know what's interesting? We begin the Christian life with that verse in John, right? John three sixteen. For God so loved the world. And you could insert your name in there. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him shall be saved and not perish, right? We begin with John, um, John 3, 16. And now we are to live out 1 John 3, 16. We are to live out 1 John 3, 16. And what is 1 John chapter 3, verse 16? Well, we're in there right now. We are to lay our lives down for others. And the true, and true Christian love will always involve service, and know that loving others is a byproduct of being in love with the Lord first and foremost. So we love others, we serve others when the Lord fills up and then our cup just spills out upon them. Now, the second mark of a believer is to show love by action, is to show love by action. Notice that with me, verses 17 and 18. Verse 17 reads, but whoever has this world's goods and see his brother in need, and shuts up his heart from him. How does the love of God abide in him? My little children, let us not love in word or in tongue, but in deed and in truth. So John, I love John. John will not allow us to merely talk about love. He knows that the real love is demonstrated by action as he observed real love in action. Mind you, John was the, the apostle that followed Jesus, and he saw love in action. So as he saw Jesus in action, loving people unconditionally, loving the woman at the well, loving the, 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 the woman that was thrown um, in front of him, and, 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 and Jesus said, go, your sins are forgiven. John saw Jesus interact with, with sinners, tax collectors. John saw Jesus interact with people that had a, a disease and wasn't afraid to touch them, and, but, but cared for them. And that was, John saw that firsthand. And so now John writes, John says, hey, we now are to love others in action. And, and so John saw it in action, and, and love is in action. As someone once said, love is a verb, right? And it, it is to love in action. And so th those two verses in verses 17 and 18, John is asking us a very uh, sober, honest question. And the question is, how can we claim to have the love of Christ and refuse to help others when it's within our power to do so? When it's within our power to do so. Know that generosity is a genuine and an out, um, outward expression of the love of, of God. It, to, be, to be generous and, 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 and to give, it, it, it's an expression of the love of God. And the book of 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 18 speaks about that. Let them do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to give, willing to share, storing up for themselves a good foundation for the time to come that they may lay hold of eternal life. So for those that John writes about that they have the material items, that they, they have the ability to bless other people and they're holding it back when they could bless someone, John says they, they should do so. And that's an, an earmarked of love. Yeah, we can't bless everybody. Of course not. But there's somebody that we can bless. And, and may we ask the Lord this week, to show us a genuine need in a person's life. And if we have the ability, let's, let's meet that need if we have the ability to do that. And if we meet someone's need, one need a week, and collectively in all of us, not only in Calvary Montclair, but the body of Christ, gosh, so much good can take place. Now, the third mark of a believer is to know that God is greater than our heart. This is such a powerful um, portion of scripture to, to know that God is greater than our heart. We're going to see that in verses 19 through 21. And by this, we know that we, uh, we know that we are of the truth and shall assure our, our hearts before him. For if our heart condemns us, here it is. God is greater than our heart and knows all things. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence towards God. Now, John, John is now saying that when we demonstrate love and action for others, we can know that we are of the truth and we can have an assurance within our heart that we are right before God. And may we always 
trust in what God says. And may we obey what God says for the reason why? Because our heart condemns us. Our heart will condemn us. So don't listen to your people say, listen to your heart. Well, we would say as believers, listen to the word and know that God is greater than your heart. The Bible speaks about in the Old Testament, our heart can deceive us. Our heart can, can um, make us feel terrible. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 17, verse 9, the prophet said, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now, there will be some times, there will be times, um, and you know this as a believer, where you will sense, you will feel, you, you will feel that your, your heart is is, is causing you to feel that you're not even a believer, a born-again believer. At that time, when your heart uh, lies to you or condemns you, it's so important to stand on truth. Why? Because the truth sets you free. And so we should always fall back upon the finished work of the cross. And so when our heart makes us um, feel terrible and that, oh, we're not even a follower of Christ or the Lord doesn't love us, go back to the cross. Rest in the finished work of the cross. And, and so our, our heart can make us feel that way. And who knows, you may have had a bad tamale, you know, <laughs> why, why your heart is not, um, you're not feeling so good. So rest in truth and don't rest in what your heart says. Now, the fourth mark of a believer is to know that we pray according to God's will. We pray according to God's will. Notice that with me in verse 22. And verse 22 says, and whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do those things that are pleasing in his sight. Powerful scripture right there. John seems to be quoting Jesus in John chapter 15, verse 7. Jesus said, if you abide in me and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire and it shall be done for you. You see, the key to prayer is being in close, abiding fellowship with the Lord. And as we are, we will then ask for the things that are on His heart. We take up His agenda with our prayer requests. The spirit of of true prayer is, Thy will be done, not my will be done. So we turn to prayer to call into action God's desires and, and know that he always answers that kind of prayer. It's a prayer that says, may your kingdom come and be done on earth as it is already done in heaven. And the person who is in fellowship with God and wants to do the things that are pleasing in his sight, when you commune with the Lord, you have fellowship with the Lord, you're going to want to do the things that the Lord wants done here on earth. You know, it, it's so sobering to, to look at our lives and see how much we do want to please ourselves versus how much we want to please the Lord. And so prayer is powerful. And no, prayer is not twisting God's arm and persuading Him to do what, what I want, what we want. It's more on getting on, on God's page and following His plans and His agenda. And so when we pray... Always have these words within your prayer, according to 1 John chapter 5, verse 14. Notice that with me as we're in the book of 1 John already. Chapter 5, verse 14. Always have these prayers, these words in your prayers when you pray. Verse 14 says of 1 John chapter 5, For this is a confidence that we have in Him, that if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. So when we pray, we, we, we say, Lord... I pray according to your will. And, and that should always be the, 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 the verbiage that when we talk to the Lord and say, Lord, let your will be done. Lord, I, I want this done, but may your will be done, Lord Jesus. And you are able. He will do exceedingly be, beyond what we can ever think and imagine. And know he can move mountains. And we want God's will. We want God's will. And so we ask the Father, Father, what do you want, Lord? And, and he will move according to his will. He will move according to his will. And I've learned something from walking with the Lord. So, Joe, what have you learned from walking with the Lord? Thank you for asking. Well, it's this. The more that I learn about God's ways, the better I learn what kind of things to ask for. 
And that's the, the, the heartbeat or the vision of Calvary Montclair. It's up here. We, we, we learn, we grow, and we share. You, you can't um, love someone you don't know, right? We all have relationships. And in order to, to form a, a, a relationship that has depth, you, 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 you have to know the person. And so we have the written word of God so we can learn about God's son, Jesus Christ, and the Lord and his ways. And as we learn about the Lord, we just can't help but fall deep in love with the Lord because he's a good God, isn't he? He loves us so much. And I love the stories about Jesus on how he would pick up a child, how he would be there, and how he was a person indeed with integrity and character and truth, and how he stood for righteousness' sake, and, and, and he didn't get political, but, but he had power in prayer. And that's who Jesus is, and you just can't help but love him. And as you love him, you can't help but to grow in him. Even the scriptures speak about that. Grow and grace and knowledge in the Lord. And especially this area of grace, I, I think that, that that virtue is lost today. People need to be gracious with one another and, and, and give each other, and give people a second chance. And, and know that no one hits a home run the first time at bat, but but would humble themselves saying, you know what? You know, I remember when, when I did this, um, I, I learned the hard way, and here's some tools that, that you can have that I learned from my mistake, and, and let me cheer you on. And, and so I just think that people need to be more gracious and kind and loving and gentle, which is the fruit of the Spirit, right? And, and, and just kind to, to other people. And, and so... We learn about that, the Lord, and so so we grow in knowledge of the Lord. We we grow in in, in in being gracious to other people. I figure there are so many people that are being harsh to other people, and I don't want to be a part of that category. I want to be opposite. I want to be gracious to people because I figure they're going to be getting harsh um, harshness. I don't know if that's a word, harshness at work or or in their family. So I just let's just be loving and kind to them, knowing that they're going to they're going to get it somewhere else, and so. We can't help but to, to love the Lord because he's a good and gracious Lord and he's been gracious to us. And so we're called to dish it out to other people, to love others and to forgive others and be kind to others. Now, the fifth and final mark of a believer is that we will have the fruit of being a child of God in our life. We will have the fruit of being a child of God in our life. And we will see that in verses 23 and 24. And verse 23 reads, and this is his commandment that we should believe on the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another as he gave us commandment. Now, he who abides, or he, I'm sorry, he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this, we know that he abides in us by the spirit whom he has given us. So John concludes this portion of scripture with four ways that identifies us as Christians Four ways that identifies us as a Christian. The first way that earmarks us or identifies us as a Christian is that we believe in the name of Jesus Christ. It's about Jesus. I, and I have this saying, it's all about Jesus. It's all about Jesus. To live is Christ. To die is gain because I get to, why is it gain? Because I get to see Jesus and be with Jesus. I get to meet John. I get to see my family members once again. And what that does is it causes our heart to be in eternity. Why is that? Because the Bible teaches where your treasure is, there goes your heart. And there's many people that I love. Even recently, um, speaking at a service, and, and another one um, has another great saint in, in the Lord's gone home to be with Jesus. And a, kind of like a piece of your heart is, is gone too. Those that have, those have, I don't want to say lose loved one because when you lose something, it implies you don't know where, where it's at, right? So I don't like using that word. They change their address. They're in heaven because we know exactly where they're at. Where your tre They're a treasure. So where your treasures are goes your heart. So our heart is in heaven. And as our heart is in heaven, we thank the Lord because it's because we believed on Jesus that, and they believed on Jesus, and whoever believes on Jesus shall be saved and they're heaven bound. And so life is about Jesus and it's gain. That's what I was going to say. Where was I going with that joke? That, there it is. 
There was a connection right there. It's gain. It's gain because we get to be with Jesus. We get to see the people that we studied about in the Bible, and we get to go to heaven. And this world continues to get dark, and it's going to get darker and get darker, even up to the election and even deep into the election, as, um, as we know that they won't know the, the final outcome um, until deep into November as um, all those ballots um, get counted and, and pray that all those ballots don't mysteriously get lost somewhere, that they all get counted. And, um, and so there's going to be tension in November. Just be prepared for that. And um, because they want their candidate to 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 be the next uh, to um, assume presidency again or be the next president, there's going to be tension. And so the answer is really not in the White House. It's in God's house and his kingdom. And so we trust Jesus. It's all about Jesus. We believe on Jesus and and, and we are not electing a a savior. We're electing someone that that. um, um, someone that follows policies and those policies follow scripture. And so we vote our conscience and our conscience is rooted in scripture. And so, um, so, so we, we, we believe on Jesus. Now, the, the second way that identifies us as a believer is that we love one another. And John wrote about that too. So we keep his commandments. We love one another. Jesus even said in John chapter 13, verse 35, they will know that you are my disciples by your love. So we love other, other people unconditionally. Even when they're not kind to us, we respond in kindness in return. And thirdly, we obey his commandments that he is. He says in verse 24, we obey his commandments. Another scripture I want to point out in 1 John chapter 5, verse 3. This is an important scripture to know. Chapter 5, verse 3. Notice with him where it says, For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And here it is. And his commandments are not what? They're not burdensome. Keeping the Lord's ways, it's not a weight. And the Lord enables us. His commandments are his enablements. And so what the Lord says, he will empower you by the power of the Holy Spirit that lives within you to carry out his laws, if you will, his word. He enables us. So we come to the Lord and say, Lord, would you help me? Would you guide me to live out this word, live out this verse, live out being loving to others? Because I'm in contact, I think, with people that I somehow they're connected and with the devil somehow. <laughs> and so to, to love them, it's difficult, but Lord, help me to love them unconditionally. And lastly, the, the fourth way that identifies us as a believer that John writes is that we abide in the Spirit. We abide in the Spirit. And as we abide in the Spirit, we have an inner witness of the Spirit that confirms it. Romans eight sixteen speaks about that. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. And as we abide in the Lord, and the Lord abides, in us, we are then empowered to believe, to obey, to love, to forgive. And what a great way to live life this week, right? And live life each and every single week. And our takeaways from our study today, that can be applied to our life tomorrow, this week, and and every day. Number one, know that Jesus is our example. Jesus is our example. And I know that um, some people have encountered believers that um, should have been um, right representatives of the Lord, or even in the pastorate or even in, in Christian leadership. And um, the enemy will say, look, they're all hypocrites. Why, why should you even go to church? Know that they didn't die on the cross for you, Jesus said. He's always your example. Yeah, should, should they have been following the word? Absolutely, they should have been. And, um, and the Lord will convict him and, and the Lord will deal with him and his ways. But no, man didn't die for you. Jesus did. And Jesus is always our example. Secondly, our second takeaway is that love should always be shown in action. Let us love in action. Let us love in action. Especially when we have the ability to help somebody else. Uh, we can't, again, help everybody. It's just impossible. And the Lord wouldn't put that heavy task upon our shoulder but the Lord will show us somebody that we can help. And whoever the Lord shows you, especially this week, just do it. And j- just help out if you can and serve if you have the means to do so. The third takeaway is that um, we know that God is greater than our heart. Your heart will constantly condemn you. Your, your heart will constantly condemn you. My heart every day somehow one way within the day condemns me one way. That I'm not doing enough. I'm not serving enough. I'm not giving enough. I'm not showing more charitable deeds enough. It's never enough. 
And the Lord says, rest in my love and, and serve me out of the overflow of the love that I give you. So don't listen to your heart. Listen to the truth of the scriptures and what the scripture says. And fourth, we pray according to God's will. So when you pray, always say, always say, Lord, is this according to your will? And lastly, we have fruit that reveals that we are a child of God. So let's live by fruit. Let's show other people what Christians look like, especially during this season that it's still the season of coronavirus. Let's show them how believers live life and what a testimony that we give, we can live to give honor and glory to our Lord. Amen. Let's pray.